The following clip from Late Night with David Letterman sprang from the fertile comic imagination of the only female writer on the show. Several years, much has been uh, said and written about Alan Alda, the TV star and the uh, film star, the motion picture director, writer, humanitarian, champion of minority causes. But surprisingly enough, we know very little about Alan Alda, a guy who likes Chinese food. That's why we're here at the Hunan Park restaurant. What kind of food does he enjoy? He likes stream beans, and he likes um, cold noodle with a sesame sauce, fried dumpling. Most uh, food we have, he likes very much. Celebrities and their dry cleaning. Special problems, how do they handle it? That's why we're here at the DuPont Dry Cleaners. Now, this was a pretty exciting Paul Newman. That, he don't come in here, but the two ladies that are with him do. They're two Janet and Louise Arters. Yeah, and they appeared in a film with them, and they bring in quite a bit of cleaning also. That writer I was referring to is coincidentally here with us. She's Meryl Marco, and just last month she won an Emmy for her writing on The Letterman Show. Now, Judith Jacqueline has worked on the National Lampoon and in association with her late husband, John Belushi. She designed the Animal House book and Blues Brothers Private. Her current book, Titters 101, which she also co-wrote, is a parody of women's literature. It used to be the trademark of female comics like Joan Rivers and Toadie Fields to make fun of themselves, their looks, their sexuality, but this is changing. Today, a woman can be funny without making fun of herself. I'm Tom Bergeron, and this here is People Are Talking. We were kidding before uh, the show that uh, we're going to analyze comedy. It probably won't be a funny show, but it'll be analytical. It'll be, you get the facts about comedy, behind the scenes of comedy, what makes stuff well, funny. That's uh, what's important. Uh, and Meryl, you brought with you, uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes, <laughs> everything that makes you laugh, right? Mm -hmm. Just about, and it's yeah, all in sure one. Did. One piece of paper. And so we'll I'll just get, hold this to the camera and then we'll get to about that. half of that makes me laugh. <laughs> uh, half of those things make you laugh? <laughs> Ha has it been difficult for, for both of you? Both of you are also associated uh, with famous male comedians. Has that been uh, to the detriment of your own careers? Well, my work with Shecky Green isn't really all <laughs> that <laughs> well known. So. <laughs> <coughs> it's certainly not been a detriment to my career. I Shecky mean. does speak highly of you, I might add. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry, I already lost the question. That's all right. Judy, now, Let me explain what detriment means to her. <laughs> has that been hard for you? Because, you know, especially all the other stuff, that's, which we're not going to talk about at all, really, uh, about John, and, and you had been, pretty much been forced behind the scenes yeah, until well, of late. I don't consider it a detriment, mm -hmm. but it certainly slowed my career down to mm -hmm. about a screeching halt. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I continued to work as I was with John, and we had our own production company, and I did things, and it was very much behind the scene. And when I did my own books, when we did our first titters in 76, you know, and I was out as Judy Jack, and I sort of had to, it, it, I, sometimes I couldn't do publicity because all they wanted, you know, we'd say up front, you know, I, I don't want to discuss these other things. And right. um, so it got in the way sometimes in that sense. And like right now with doing Titters on One, it's, it's been a little difficult to get out there and really talk about what I'm trying to talk about. But, you know, I... What are you going to do? Now, are we, are, is this finally going to be the time when women in comedy are going to be accepted as, sure, they can make people laugh just as well as those guys can? I don't know. We're making great strides. We have our first, this is the 80s, you know, it's the women's decade, ab absolutely. We have our first woman vice president. We have, we finally... Well, not quite yet. I well, mean, no, well, yeah. I'm sorry, vice, vice presidential candidate. We have uh, the woman, uh, women finally uh, were able to run the marathon in the Olympics, you know, and men have been doing this since before Christ, mm -hmm. you know, right? mm -hmm. So we're really catching up now. What, now, now without, with the exception of your show, though, uh, with, Le with Letterman's show, is the only real place for a woman to have a regular national spot. The Carson her, show, right. uh, outside of Joan Rivers, you don't see many uh, comedians on that. Yeah, well, I guess that's sort of true. Um, but stand-up is just a very odd area also. I mean, there's not, just not a lot of call for it on TV. I mean, it's just pretty much the Carson show and Dave show, so it's, there's just not a lot of arena for it except for in private clubs and what is it though about a about a woman doing stand-up comedy that some people maybe in the Carson's booking office or whatever think is something well, that the public won't buy it's long historical problem with just women getting into any field I, I feel and with with uh, um, comedy it's it's aggressive 
to be funny. I mean, you have to be out there and you're, you're throwing your opinion around by virtue of things you say, and uh, that's not ladylike. Mm -hmm. so. That's why it was safer for someone like Phyllis Diller just to make jokes about herself. Well, look at how they even pre presented themselves. Uh, you know, it's uh, the funny look. Um, mm -hmm. Even Joan Rivers, when she first started, and uh, Phyllis taking it to the most extreme with her hair and everything. And Lucille Ball, you know, big orange lips, and, I mean, red lips and orange hair. Right. right. I guess there's not a lot of precedent for female monologists historically, but then the guys were doing the same thing just to a certain extent. I mean, there was the, you know, the old baggy pants vaudevillian tradition for men to make fun of themselves, too. I mean, a lot of comedy is self-deprecatory in nature. I mean, it, it's the vulnerable part of people that is funny. You know, a, a beautiful, successful person is not all that funny. I mean, that I think that's just some of uh, why you had Joan Rivers. And, I mean, not, not to defend the, their self-deprecating nature mm -hmm. of their comedy, but on the other hand, I think that just is part it's of. It's not comedy. just something women are doing. There's some. There's well, some I think I think human vulnerability is funny. Yeah. And I guess I guess women felt more backed into that corner. I know from when I used to do stand-up that men are kind of threatened by a woman, you have to slowly earn your way into their graces when you, when you perform, that they, when a guy, I used to have this theory that when a guy came out, they would just assume the guy was funny and then he'd slowly withdraw the chips, you know, they well, he's not so funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when a woman came out, it was sort of the other way, it just slowly, they slowly give you a point and then another point and another point. And then finally, I mean, people will, if you're funny, it, it does out, you know, people do give you the credit for being funny, I think, I mean, funny stand-up comedians do well in clubs. Right. One of the things that you've done for uh, Late Night with David Letterman is, is give animals a chance to be funny <laughs> on national television, which uh, previously, outside of a few Lassie episodes that come to mind, they didn't have much opportunity to do. Uh, here we have, uh, for those of you who have uh, poetic slants, uh, this is Bob the dog. No, this no, is, no, this is not Bob. This, this isn't is, Bob? No, this is who Stan. Is this? This no, is Stan. I see, I oh, I get they, <laughs> they look a lot alike. But anyway, this is Stan the dog and, uh, and a summer poem. <laughs> That's, that's, that was Stan, and I think Bob is coming up later, right? Well, have, no, we have some Bob. important work here. Okay, well, Bob's, <laughs> now, what other things? Let's go to that list. What are some of the other things that Meryl Marco and, and Judy, feel free to chime in here if, if you agree or disagree, you right. find funny? Well, I guess uh, what I was thinking about, I made this list up trying to predict what this conversation was going to be about, you know, and uh, I guess what I, I generally find funny, because I do a lot of remote segments on Dave's show, which means it's the pieces that are taped outside of the studio like you saw the Alan right, Alda, and then right. I guess what I do is I, I tend to walk around and find things funny, and then I tend to try to backtrack and figure out what the questions are that made me think the thing is funny. Like with Alan Alda, to me, I have always wondered why people have those pictures of celebrities up at all these places. So it was Dave's show, he gave me the forum, the camera crew, and the the equipment to go and ask these people and get and record the answers is why they did have the photos. Now, when, the, when <laughs> these people, a lot of the times, they don't uh, appear to get it. Uh, well, you know, they... To some extent, they don't get it. They don't know why I'm asking them that. Right. I mean, most people don't examine their own logic. Like, uh -huh. I, I am very entertained by signs. I did a piece that didn't work out so well on Dave's show last night that was just about slogans that people put out in front of their stores. I mean, I just tend to find that kind of thing amusing. I want to know why people made the choices they made with language and various things. Like, um, I understand that maybe you're going to show the Just Bulbs clip. Yes. Well, the Just Bulbs thing, that, that made me laugh because... 
that's just playing the stupid person. I mean, a store is called Just Bulbs, so obviously we know what they sell, and I thought it was funny to go in and say to them, so what all do you have here? And plus the other store <laughs> you show, too, is, is even a bigger payoff. But we have to take a break, so we will get to that list. Don't stray away. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. I wanted to find out who the other guests were, but we can do that later, I guess. <laughs> so joining us now is Deanne Stillman, co-author of Titters 101. She was a staff writer for the Square Pegs comedy show. She founded and edited Bitch, the first humor magazine for women, and has been a contributing editor to Swank Gallery, and her articles have appeared in The Village Voice more, and The Realist, her favorite hobbies. No, no, we won't go into that now. <laughs> What does it feel like to have compiled the first, now Titters 101 is the sequel, right? right. Titters came out when, back in? In 76, okay. that was the first collection of humor by women. Now, w you were breaking new ground. Now, were you involved in that one too, yes. Judy? At that point, I was the art director designer. How did, uh, how did people respond to the first Titters? Well, we sold 100,000 copies, so I would say that, that they responded. That's not shabby. No, that's not <laughs> shabby at all. We uh, used up the entire province of Saskatchewan, I believe, on the <laughs> second printing, so. We were pretty pleased with that, um, and uh, we just we uh, decided to do a sequel a few years ago. This this being Titters 101, and it took us three years to do it. Now this is uh, for anyone who uh, wants to be introduced to women's literature. This is the best way to do it, right? Definitely the best and the only way to do the it. The only way. Yeah. The only way to go. Why was it that it took until 1976 for uh, women humorists to get together, or for there to be any form? I was reading in some of the notes that. You can find more humorous writing by women in Playboy than you can in like a, a woman, a quote, woman's she knows magazine, about that. like well, a that's ladies' true. home journal the or men's something. Men's magazines have have um, <coughs> traditionally printed more humor than women's magazines, and I don't really know why that is. It's it's kind of too bad, but they have they yeah. have been more th they are more liberal. I mean, that's just the way it is. So if if you wanted to get in ladies' home journal, I'm suspecting you'd have to write something like funny you'd have tips with four mica or something. Exactly, like that. you'd have you would have to to uh, turn in some humorous rice pilaf recipes. And yeah, that would, that right. would be it. Right. So there's a very li is there still is the market still that limited? Well, there are a lot of humorous rice pilaf recipes. <laughs> yeah, so I know. it is open <laughs> Pays my rent. Do we do we have that? We have uh, now. We were talking about. 
uh, your list and talking about uh, just bulbs, which I think has been <laughs> overrun by customers since the spot. <laughs> and let's take a look at that from Late Night with David Letterman, another uh, piece inspired by Merrill, Just Bulbs. Just bulbs. And that's exactly what we sell, just bulbs. Okay, so besides bulbs, what do you have here? Nothing. How about shades? Could you get shades here? No, we are just bulbs. If you want shades, maybe go to a place called Just Shades. We sell that. Kind of what, uh, what is the name of the store? Just Shades. And uh, what, what can you get in here? What can you get in here? All the shades. Mm -hmm. That's why we're... So that's why our name is Just Shades. But seriously, what, what can you get besides shades here? Didn't you also do a show where you had all these people, it was an anniversary show, and you had all these people show up from yeah, all these... Yeah, after sitting in hours and hours of editing, editing these things, uh, it dawned on me that it would be interesting to have them all show up at one time in one place. It and was, they came in I black guess, tie, didn't they? <laughs> and they were introduced by Army Archer, the voice of <laughs> Hollywood and the friend of the stars. <laughs> that's great. Now, how many of you have done stand-up here? Merrill and... Uh, that, okay, that's one. <laughs> uh, why did you stop? Uh, gee, gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. I think about it all the time. I think about it every, every day. I think I stopped for one reason, because when Dave got his morning show, I started working on it, and then we were getting up at 5 in the morning, and you have to hang out till all hours of the night at these little clubs in order to get those times. Because it's very rewarding, as it is punishing also. You get credit for what you do, and that's always something. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you, that, there's a lot of anonymity to writing for television. On the other hand, it also has its rewards. You were mentioning before that uh, most of your best lines <laughs> now David is using in terms of, uh, and even back oh, in the, the stand-up. man has robbed me. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a living hell, and at last I have a form. There he is laughing. And we're glad you're here to But when, when you were both doing, doing stand-up together, what was it that you felt uh, was making him hit quicker than you? Uh, well, making him hit, well, he, he's been in broadcasting since he was uh, 18 or 19. I, I mean, he has a tremendous background in performing and, and television. And, uh, and he, was, he had been at it several years before I ever started doing it and started writing him lines. And he's just very good. You know, I'm, I, I was not as relaxed a performer as he is. And, uh, and I think there is a greater handicap in some ways, like you were discussing with women doing stand-up. But I don't know that I wouldn't, you know, have gotten better at it, he was just better at it already, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, you know, I, I don't think I was the reason that he became successful, he was going to become successful anyway, but the reason I could write for him is he and I had enough of a common sense of humor for us to, you know, get involved with each other. So. Hey, Judy and Deanne, is, is Titters 101 a book that uh, appeals to all sexes? Kids from 8 to 80, all sexes, <laughs> all races, creeds, religions. Um, we, we use the format of a college textbook in, in which to present these parodies of literature down through the ages, but we also use this format as a jumping off point to talk about everything from Pasta Primavera to Eddie Fisher. Right. So I would say... <laughs> the first say time <laughs> those two subjects have appeared in the same <laughs> book, we might add. Uh, what, what have been some of your inspirations in, in writing this and other writing? In writing in general? Well, what about you, Deanne? Did you, were you ever inspired? inspired to, uh, to do this to book, do yes, because people mm -hmm. kept clamoring for a sequel to the first one. But in, me, of, it was more first, uh, more in terms of people that have inspired you in, in ways of your writing style uh -huh. and things yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, sort of the usual round yeah. of humor suspects. Um, I grew up reading James Thurber and uh, Robert Benchley, Dorothy Parker. In fact, in Titters 101, we, ha we have a piece called, we have a piece written by Dot Benchley, who was a combination of Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley, of course. But all of those writers were pretty uh, influential in my early years, mm -hmm. Perlman, um, a lot of writers with two initials, H.L. Mencken. Th those are <laughs> I don't know what that means. It's always a clue they're going to be funny if yeah. they have two initials. Yeah. For me, it was more the whole book, uh, the way we do our style is, is unique, and there's a lot of visual tied in with it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of comic book influence, basically. It's like uh, I try to I figure, as I get older, we, the writing is getting, we have like five or six pages of writing now <laughs> before you actually have a visual. And I, I try to, because uh, I also design this, get people fix the style so that you will you can flip through and find something that you can read quickly and immediately without having to sit down for a long time and read but it, it hopefully kind of fools you into reading because you'll start with something little before you know it you're actually reading one of these pieces. Mm -hmm. Tommy, I interject that. Yes, you, you know, may. we were discussing 
how just how entertaining this discussion might be. I'd like to point out there is a gentleman falling asleep. <laughs> is this well. Where is he? <laughs> his so he came in like so that. His, <laughs> his hand is permanently grafted to his cheek like that. So he is falling asleep. So I think we are. Let's get to our that list then. Let's let's get to that list. When in doubt. All right. What are some of the other uh, things I find funny? Comedy subjects. That well, I guess I I find pretty much everything funny. That's a problem. I mean, I, it was the sort of this thing when I was nonsense. She likes everything. <laughs> it was it was the sort of the thing that when you're growing up, your mother always says, "What is everything a joke with you?" And it turns out it is. Was that a, was that something for everybody that your personalities were such that uh, you weren't fulfilling your parents' wildest dreams for you? Or well, I think I I always liked the fact that I could tell when they'd say, "Oh, don't be such a you know wise whatever." Um, <laughs> that there was a level of uh, appreciation in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I just kept going for it, you know. I think mine always told me to stop daydreaming, young lady, and of course I haven't. I never did because they told me to stop it, and now that's how I make my living. So. Uh -huh. Now, how do they how do they deal with it now? If you providing, of course, your parents are still around to deal with it at all. Well, in terms of wildest dreams, I think that I actually have continued going through that in a wilder phase than she had hoped. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, uh -huh. I think it went to the wildest dreams and passed. <laughs> Right. What, are some, what are some of the things that, uh, and we may have touched on this before, but that have changed in terms of what a woman can do on stage now that she couldn't do before? Joan Rivers, I remember reading, lost a job because she was just too, her last line was, I'm Joan Rivers and I put out. And, <laughs> and there's, no, I'm sorry, lady, we can't use you here. Uh, what are you some can't of the, say that? What are some of the things that you can say, <laughs> say it now? Oh. Well, I do know she does. I just wanted to <laughs> <laughs> It's a horrible thing. What type of tone can a woman com uh, comedian take now that she couldn't take? Well, in our case, we do whatever we want. No one ever <laughs> stops us. Yeah. And on Dave's show, we do whatever we want. No one seems to be stopping us I there. I know, but Dave's show is the only place to do that, too. And wh yeah. what type of... A, like and that's why I keep returning to it. I've left a couple of times to pursue other projects, but the fact that he's on the air and we have a certain license to do peculiar things there is a tremendous luxury. I mean, I, you know, far, you were mentioning it being a detriment to be to be working with him and and far from it you know because of his likability and because that show is on the air we are putting things on that show that you could never sell to a committee of network executives were you to go in and try and sell them on their own they would say well you and I find it funny but they won't find it funny pretending to second guess. That's absolutely right you know because I, I was a uh, staff writer for Square Pegs the CBS sitcom that was on last year and it was really a lot different writing for a network television show than your own particular show uh, for instance, Judy and Ann Beats, our third collaborator here, and I are doing a, a Showtime special now called Titters, which mm -hmm. is which is <laughs> presumably which will presumably be a lot different. Yeah, than network tell that. May well be. We're going to check that out. Yes, uh, Phase Five, the final conflict here. But <laughs> really, it was a lot different um, presenting uh, work to a panel of network executives, and and they really have you know working within that format is much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. What is it what has it been like uh, f to take for example Anne was writing for Saturday Night Live in its first incarnation mm -hmm. to go to Square Pegs uh, were they a lot harder on you the network censors and things? Well it's not so much that that the censors come right out and say uh, absolutely not uh, Johnny Slash has to wear a t-shirt in his in, when his <laughs> rock act open I mean they're it's much more insidious than that they say things like uh, I remember in the Christmas episode, we wanted to have have uh, one of the kids, Vinnie Pacetta, the, the Italian stallion at the school, have a keg of beer in his basement. And they said, you can't say keg on primetime television. You're kidding. Well, we said, like, you can't say what keg? Did they, was it okay if he had a six-pack? Right, what was wrong with keg? <laughs> and they just, they just, they couldn't answer, but they just would, they had Don't very you know what keg means? It's something <laughs> really dirty. Yeah. Yeah. They had it, that was it, yeah. We have, to, meaning. we have to take a break. We're going to uh, translate keg into a number of different <laughs> languages, and Rita Rudner will join us, uh, stand-up comedians, to stay with us.
Right now on our stage here on People Are Talking, a uh, stand-up comedian who's appeared uh, numerous times on Late Night with David Letterman. I saw her in one of her first performances back in the comic strip uh, back, I think as David would say, in the late 1950s or something. <laughs> and here she is, Rita Rudner. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> It's nice to be here and people are talking. Uh, I've been on TV for a while though. I've, I've done some commercials. Um, I have to tell you, I've announced to the country that I have bad breath. <laughs> I have dandruff. I have problem perspiration. Sometimes people recognize me on the street. They try to hose me down. <laughs> and I started out very classy in show business, really. I, well, I was a ballerina. I was. I had to quit the ballet, though, after I injured a groin muscle. It wasn't mine. <laughs> he's doing very well, though, really. He's a soprano with the Vienna Boys Choir. There are other reasons I had to leave the ballet. One of them was I was terrible. <laughs> In Swan Lake, I was the lifeguard. <laughs> I had other jobs that were very boring. Um, I enjoyed this a lot. I was a stewardess for a while on a helicopter. <laughs> there were about five, six people tops, I would say, so. Would you like something to drink? <laughs> you would. <laughs> well, then we're gonna have to land. <laughs> <laughs> I had the most boring office job in the world. I used to clean the windows on the envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going better now, flying. We flew here today from New York. It's a short flight, the shuttle. There's no time to serve food or anything. The stewardesses just kind of stand in the front and throw nuts. <laughs> First class is a little nicer. They throw them underhand. <laughs> <laughs> they say flying is safer than driving. I don't believe them. I can't help it when my car engine stalls. Oxygen masks don't fly out of the ceiling. <laughs> Flying is safer than taking a taxi in New York City, though, because they're crazy. If you ever go there, be very careful. I was in two taxi accidents last year. One, I was standing on the sidewalk. <laughs> One, I was in an elevator. <laughs> I find people in uh, tourists, especially in New York, talk to me a lot, because don't I look like a friendly New Yorker? Yes, thank you. Don't I also look like I don't know where anything is? <laughs> Sometimes tourists stop me on the street. They say, excuse me, are you lost? <laughs> I like Boston, too. I worked here for a while, about a year ago. I was staying in Howard Johnson's. And it's true, their slogan used to be, they've changed it now. It used to be, if it's not your mother, it must be Howard Johnson's. I thought it was just a slogan. I was staying there. Called down for room service about four in the afternoon. I was very hungry. They said, no, it'll spoil your dinner. <laughs> the maid came in every morning. She said, clean up your room. <laughs> As I was checking out, the lady behind the desk said, go ahead, leave. Doesn't matter, I'll be dead in a couple weeks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Lousy host, didn't even take your hand without being prompted. <laughs> now, you've been doing that again. We were talking before. I saw you. Second of oh, all right. <laughs> it's hard to be comfortable. It's, it's very hard. hard. This, is, this is just for. <laughs> you guys, this is uh, yeah. I'm a lot shorter. I don't want to sit here. I have lower back problems, so. Oh. Can we have some more of the orthopedic pillows out here, please? <laughs> Dan, did you want a pillow? We have extra. Yeah, can here. I have all I want the pillows. We're losing Rita. Wait a minute. You're better than me. I don't. You have gray on. You want to try it? We'll. No, I got this. All right. We'll be right with you. You want, did you want that? I would. That's all right. Thank you. You can take those. All right. All right. Anybody want the book? We're going to... No. This yeah, I'll take it. Good? <laughs> so, you know, I saw you five years ago in a comic strip, and uh, it was one of your first times <laughs> going. Right, could can you, you hold could up you, our book uh, again? Uh, I think we, I think we really should talk right. about that. So anyway, it was, it, was one of the, it was one of the first times you had performed. Can we go to a commercial now, or are we still on? Darn hijinks. He's uh, Whatever. Oh. Put that on right, right will you? Jeez. <laughs> true. I noticed this before. It must have been. I mean, I was there and it was real hard to be up there on an audition night when all of the people <laughs> were looking under the table and, uh, <laughs> sorry, you're supposed to be here. No, no. That's what makes him laugh. What are you going to ask next? What time? made you keep coming back for more? What was the question? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> About stand-up comedy and things. 
what what made me what's keep doing that to myself? Yes. Um, I just had got it in my head that I was going to be funny and I was going to do it no matter what. I mean, you were funny that night, but but it was one of the first times, and not everybody knew that you were funny. I didn't even know what I was. Right. <laughs> no, because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, that was probably one of the first times I ever did anything on a stage. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know anything. But I knew you solely from the yogurt commercial at that I point. I did this yogurt commercial. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I said that's the gal from the yogurt commercial. Mm -hmm. What? When that so that style there, that sort of vacant stare that you've perfected. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was that an outgrowth of just the sheer terror that you were feeling? Um, I, I don't know. I don't even know that I have that. But I guess if you say I have that. It's like a show of hands. <laughs> vacant stare. Vacant. Someone, someone said you had a, it's like Gracie Allen if she studied Woody Allen records. <laughs> it's, a, it's a type of persona you have. Oh. Does that sound accurate, or do you ever think about? Sounds nice. Maybe sounds you meant nice. Karen yeah. Allen. Karen Allen. That's what it is. Because <laughs> yeah, you punched some guy in the jaw, I think, when he wasn't laughing. That's probably all. But um, <laughs> do, you, do you think about having a persona at all? I feel like Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone has gone berserk here. Um, uh, do I think about having a persona? I, on I'm, stage. Like, on stage. This line would work for me, this line wouldn't because I it doesn't fit in my character. I have a sense of what would work and what wouldn't just from standing up and doing it over and over night after night. I say things and people don't laugh. I say, oh, I won't say that again. <laughs> and that's I say things and they good, laugh. That's, that's exactly what it gets down to. That's exactly it. All right, we have a, a phone call, I think, from Rita's agent, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Let's go to that now. Hello. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, my question is for those of you that have written for um, shows before. Um, <laughs> what? What, uh, basically, how much does the uh, artist himself or the comedian himself um, put into your work? You know, how much influence does he have on your uh, writing for a show or her? Okay. I think he means the performer. The performer. How much does the performer add to it? Letterman be able to put into your oh, work. Okay. Um, right. Oh, well, that I, I literally write every little thing that Dave says. I mean, every little, you know, an ad lib. You even tell him when to wipe his forehead with the cards and things, right? More or yeah. less, I have to pretty much write his conversations to his mother on his telephone. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> the guy is without verbal acuity. Very interesting. So you really have to get back to New York this afternoon for the taping here. <laughs> I don't even get to work. in Boston, so I figure I could say anything I want. Has that, was that something like on Square Pegs where you wrote something and thought this is funny and then the performer really brought it to life or destroyed it? <laughs> no, I, I would say that Square Pegs was uh, a lot different than other television shows, and at least situation comedies in that way, because the writers were uh, encouraged, if not ordered, to be on the set while the show was uh, being shot, and we worked closely with the director and the actors in, in terms of uh, how speeches were said, and, and that really worked out nicely, because a lot of times the uh, actors uh, didn't, weren't saying the speeches right. <laughs> So it was nice that the writers were on the well, set. Well, you know, there was there was some some press about that show that mm -hmm. uh, there were reasons why they couldn't even tie their shoes. Uh, it it? Well, the TV guy that was <laughs> well, who couldn't tie heavy, shoes? heavy drug use. Don't ask Deanne about that. Oh, I wasn't supposed to ask about that. Right, was supposed to ask that about? <laughs> no, that's oh, why okay, I was. I right. finished hearing the song. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. But but so that stuff was. <laughs> That, that's uh, one of those subjects we weren't supposed to talk about. <laughs> that, that was a, a myth, a fabrication of TV Guide? or Yes, totally. They, they wanted to, uh, the, the person who wrote that article was somebody who was very disgruntled about not being a television writer himself. And yeah. early, very early on in the season had literally begged me to visit the set and hang around. And had written a very glowing article about th about the show, which appeared in the Orange County Register, I believe. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> he, then he moved up to TV Guide with this smear piece that he had written uh, in solely for the purpose of uh, attacking the show. Okay, we'll never discuss that again, Rita. Um, <laughs> you've you've opened now for a number of acts. Where, where are some of the places that you have played? Atlantic City. Mm-hmm. Is it, that couch, <laughs> the couch may swallow you. It's yeah. being let out a little shock yeah, of horrors. Yeah. In, in I, just, I was just in Atlantic City last weekend opening for Peebo Bryson uh -huh. and opened for Tony Orlando and Hal Linden and Sergio Mendez. Now, some of these performers that you open for have different styles or would appeal to different groups of people, I would think, than your subtle humor. Anyone who comes to Atlantic City <laughs> would appeal to something different. 
than what I am. <laughs> is, does that make it like uh, very painful for a while during the set? Or? Yeah, it's very hard, but it's very rewarding because I really want them to like me and I really want to do a good job. And I stand there and for the first 10 minutes, they don't know what I'm doing because they've never seen a woman who doesn't scream and, you know, and just stands there and says funny things. And then they figure it out after the first 10 minutes, and then they laugh the rest of the time. So it's usually okay, but the first 10 minutes, they don't know. Okay, we have to take a break. We're going to get a hydraulic lift for reader's portion of the couch, <laughs> and we'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, we're continuing our in-depth analysis of women in comedy here <laughs> and uh, we're taking some questions from our audience. <laughs> this uh, from Meryl. Uh, I noticed especially, how are you, uh, last evening and a few times that you've been shown on camera on the Letterman show, you never look real thrilled about it. Is, <laughs> is I mean, is that something you just don't like, or is it you're too involved in your it's, work? It's I guess? such torture for me. It's torment. It's a horrible, horrible. Uh, well, last night uh, that was just us trying to save that, dig that piece out of a hole. <laughs> we thought <laughs> we were taping that piece. We thought. What piece Here was that? Go. It was a remote that I shot that actually played pretty well to the audience, but when we were out there shooting it, we, it was uh, seven hours edited down to about four minutes, and, it, and the four minutes I pulled out of it finally went pre pretty well. It was about commercial slogans. I had my friend Dave out uh, haranguing store owners about the slogans they had on the front of their buildings, such as, Zan, the richness that is woman. <laughs> <laughs> made me laugh when I saw it. You know, That's actually I, a show <laughs> we're doing next week. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so at the end of it, I had him uh, do a close to the piece that said, you're probably saying to yourselves, gee, that didn't go so well. <laughs> I was presuming that it wasn't by the time. But it actually played better than, <laughs> than the close uh, called for. And then, they, then, I, then he introduced all the members of the crew. And so it was, I mean, it, that was, it wasn't that I wasn't thrilled. I was. I just didn't want to be in right. vain. Uh, OK, now, Meryl, you gave me the correct way of doing this. Uh, I want to just practice. All right. Hello, is uh, the caller there? <laughs> no, I guess not. He <laughs> scared him. He thought he was on Donnie. Right. Hello, <laughs> right, yeah. Hello, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, question please, comment. I'd like to direct it to Meryl if I could. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Meryl. 
How you doing? <laughs> I'd like to know how would be the best way about getting into comedy and what does a good comedy rake make nowadays, money wise, dollars? <laughs> Now, I, now I'm this part of the. What's Very the best in? way of getting into comedy, and what does a, what was the rest of it? Right, the like part? yourself on David Letterman, or not yourself personally, but what do as a good comedy rate right, dollars wise? Nice. Can you rephrase the question for me? I think me, it Tom? was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, as far the as last that part goes. we missed. How much money will you make if you How do much it? How much do you make personally? A, a good, a, not, not personally. A good, a good comedy writer per year oh, okay. makes. All right, a good comedy writer. Per year. Like well, you could say like on television. A lot of us are in the Fortune 500, let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the top so money. <laughs> and our comedy special union is 5,000 something, correct? It make, you make good money. I uh -huh. used to teach art briefly. I taught painting at USC <laughs> and I made uh, considerably less. I well, feel it's coarse to quote exact figures, but you make, it's, it's a good paying job. But if you figure all the jokes you put out into space and how much time you spend on it, oh, right. you yeah, advertise cheap. it over a lifetime, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> those, those, those suckers just stay out there, right? Sure. That's after you broadcast Bouncing it, those around the room, other people take them. That's being right. appreciated by and untold And all the joy cultures. you bring into households all across this country. In right. <laughs> <laughs> Immeasurable. But uh, how would someone like this gentleman start in comedy and become wealthy beyond his dreams? Get out of the house send in the afternoon. Send us his jokes. We'll right. take it from there. And they'll be, they'll be sure to give you the credit you so richly deserve for them. I I bet, right? The serious answer is, the, w the way that you do it is, is you, uh, you submit, if you wanted to, for instance, I assume he's talking about trying to write on, on uh, something like Dave's show, and, and we do read material. I should never say this, of course, because we're already getting plenty of unsolicited material, and I, it's not really accepted policy to read it, but, but you, what you should do is write material that sounds to you like the kind of material you see on the show already because what you see on the show is not an accident. It isn't that that it, the material just by accident all sounds alike. It's because it, there's a particular style. So you should try to write for someone particular and measure up to to what you think is the standard that they are trying to, uh, which of course in our case is very up for grabs. But okay. uh, and, and the other need thing an example. one might do is either be a stand-up, which is a good way that you're, you, you're showing your sense of humor right there out to people directly. Or starting your own projects, as Dan and, I, and Dan and I had done with Titters. Okay. We take a break. All right, we're gonna take a break. More questions from our audience and uh, things like that. So stay with us.
All right, we're back, and uh, the panel was reading Barry Katz's quote there, and Barry took quite a bruising uh, during that break. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what do you think about that? If you want to be a woman in comedy in Boston, you have to be twice as good as a man. I don't know. I'm from New in York. Chicago. You got to be three or four times. Three or four. Yeah. <laughs> New York, you can imagine. But, I just know I mean, that everything Barry Katz says generally is true. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you have the feeling we're out on an in joke here. <laughs> it, do we have the other clip of because uh, we we promised equal time for Bob, the dog. We don't have Bob. Oh, okay. Oh darn. Uh, All right. Uh, but we have the Barry Katz clip. No, we yeah. don't. Have that. <laughs> Rita, was that something that you found in going and working your way up to the Atlantic City clubs uh, that it was you had to shall I say, score more often on stage than, uh, than male comedians? No. <laughs> okay, that's about it for our show. Uh, be... No, I don't compare myself to other people. I just, I'm as funny as I can be, and I'm doing well. I don't know. But whether you compare yourself or not, the club owners might be making it more difficult for women to get equal chances on the funny, stage. If I'm funny, they or... hire me. Uh-huh. Then I'm funny, so they hire me. Okay. Now, on, on The Letterman Show, where there are more women comics than on any other show, what, what is it, 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 there's no different cr criteria for, uh, oh, for a booking there? Oh, absolutely. A woman has to be twice as funny. <laughs> well, well, see, there you go. There's that ugly theory popping up, <laughs> popping up again. How about somebody like Joan Rivers? Joan Rivers is at the pinnacle of, of uh, comedy right now in terms of being the, the permanent guest host on The Tonight Show. Uh, she's gotten all the press, every magazine cover. She's in a Cosmo parody, so she's really made it. Uh, what do you feel about her type of humor? <laughs> well, we, lost, we lost Judy on that one. We can't little, talk, really. She's uh, maybe two and a half times as funny. <laughs> one and a half, half times. I think she's funny. I think that TV will eat her up, and, we, and the media will go after her in about 60 minutes or so, probably. Was she making on Letterman's show? I remember let, uh, an analysis of Letterman's show, I think by one of the Boston papers, said the interesting thing about it is that Angie Dickinson could be on the Carson show as a superstar, and the next hour could be on David's show as a has-been. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of has-beens. <laughs> 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 you, right you know what I mean? In terms right. of the audience that he appeals to, and there's a different it's true, sense there about are, it. There are certain comedians who would not go well on Dave's, uh, on Dave's show. I was telling you, We've sort of bred an audience of uh, sarcastic people, <laughs> and sarcasm plays plays well. In fact, I'm always sort of amazed at how a little raised eyebrow will get a laugh on Dave's show. But big, broad, cliche-oriented stuff doesn't play so well. I'm like, strangely enough, some people who have been classic comedians for years and years did badly on Dave's show, where a new comedian like Rita did really well. Like Phyllis Diller did very badly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, hi, Phil. <laughs> I don't know Phil, but I mean she was the wrong kind of comedy for that audience. Not that she's not funny or good at what she does. For who am I to say? But yeah. go ahead right. and say it. Question. <laughs> she's not funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> two things. Uh, as far as censorship goes on these shows, um, besides sex and drugs, do you have to avoid politics or religion or diseases or death or anything like that? Diseases are always funny. Yeah. We would never, we would never avoid that. We don't actually. Um, we we sort of choose to avoid sex and drugs just because it's it tends to be an easy laugh. It's a buzzword, you know. You, well, plus NBC, kind of, the NBC said no drugs anyway, right? That's so. right. Well, other comedians, we yeah, don't tend to write off. much drug material, yeah. but other right. comedians who have come on, like Rita's act, is just loaded. <laughs> that racy drug humor. Well, that's one. Yeah. Well, also, yeah. I think it depends on how long the person has been dead when it comes to humor about death, because. I remember uh, uh, during a uh, particular Square Pegs episode, uh, I had written a joke about using the names Cole Porter and Gary Gilmore in the, in the same sentence, because both of them had a have actually said, let's do it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the network executives were very upset about the Gary Gilmore reference, and I think that, that it was because he really hadn't been... It he hadn't been dead long enough. Yeah, but, they weren't upset but, about Yeah, him. but Gary Gilmore died under decidedly different circumstances than Cole Porter, too. Yes, but they both did say, let's too. do it. They did. I was no <laughs> arguing that. Go ahead. You follow. The other half was, is it conceivable that a comedian would do well or poorly with your studio audience and, and the opposite with your national audience? That's what they say to everyone who doesn't do well. They said, you <laughs> see? <laughs> 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 the audience loves you, though. We've had calls. Is that true or not true? Is it? There's no way to really tell. I think... 
I, I like writing for Dave's show for the same, same reason that I used to like doing stand-up, which is that I think an audience will tell you when things are funny. And an audience keeps you honest in that way. I mean, things that, that don't, they'll laugh at one joke and then not laugh at the next. There's no way of knowing whether it's entertaining people at home. So it, it is true some things are more exciting live in a studio than they are when you see them at home. TV tends to level experience, but there's hardly any way to really know. So Phyllis Diller could have been terrible. All right, you need, we need one of these handy <laughs> Mr. Microphones <laughs> yeah. to be heard. Her That's what her agent told her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's quickly, your question back here. This is back to the writing thing. Um, I know the Carson show will use someone for two or three months and maybe even longer. Um, is it the same with Letterman? How big is the writing staff? Uh, oh, the writing staff is about, we're up to about 11 folks right now. And uh, yeah, we use them for two or three months and then we throw them <laughs> out like a soiled towel. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're lucky if they ever get another job, right? They just That's right. Suck dry. Okay, we'll be, we'll be right back after this. back with a few more minutes and a few more questions. Go ahead. I'd like to say quickly, I thought that Square Pegs was an excellent, excellent program, and I was very sorry to see it leave the air. Of course, I've been a fan of Letterman since, I don't know, the late 50s. <laughs> My question is, why do you feel that comedians such as Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, and the other Saturday Night Live regulars have made it while people like Gilda Radner and Lorraine Newman really haven't? Well, there are women. You might have noticed. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think they've been busy on their family and home lives as opposed to their careers. Also, it depends how you define making it. I mean, what, I, I don't think you can really say that Gilda Radner and Lorraine Newman haven't made it. But parts I aren't mean, written for them with the same dispatch that they're written true. for Murray or Ackerman. No, it's true. It comes down to writing. Don't get yeah, the, Kate uh, and Allie is, uh, is Jane Curtin. She yeah, was, you know, Jane she's Curtin, in yeah. the same. Right. Just right. people have different times for when they, mm -hmm. things go well for them, I guess. Mm -hmm. But they're also having problems with Chevy Chase now finding good parts for him. I so. thought after that co-starring stint with Benji, Chevy right. Chase was on the road for <laughs> millions of dollars. Well, the thing with Letterman is that even if the writing, of course, it's never really bad, but even if it's just a slight bit mm -hmm. off, he tends to save it just for his simple, uh, the gap in his teeth or whatever. He, just, right. he, can, he can bail out of anything and make it sound good, right. or at least plausible. What do you think of that quality is about him that, uh, that very few other comedians have? 
It's, it's absolutely true. Uh, that's, that's one thing that is the challenge for a writer with Dave. He, he comes out good off of any joke. You know, he won't die with the joke. <laughs> that's why you have to try, to, you try your best to give him something good that he won't duck out of, because if it isn't playing, he saves his, his life. <laughs> He's just, yeah. don't stop you and I know that isn't any good. Yeah, <laughs> so don't, don't, don't stop the stupid pet tricks, by the way. The dog in the box was great. <laughs> that was, now that's another thing that you came up with, right? The, the stupid pet tricks? Yes, I am the creator of stupid pet tricks. Uh-huh, what is the, uh, <laughs> Was, uh, were Bob and Stan the inspiration for <laughs> that? Or? The actual inspiration for it wasn't so far off from that. We were thinking of things when we were gearing up. It was Dave's morning show. We were trying to figure out what should be on the show, and I was realizing that everyone I knew who had a dog, and I'm always thinking about dogs because I have a couple, has some <laughs> stupid thing they always make you watch them do. Like I was thinking of a particular friend of mine who one evening, to amuse me, put socks on his dog. <laughs> <laughs> Which is barely amusing, and of course I'm not friends with this person any longer. But <laughs> Uh, Rita, uh, let's pontificate for 20 seconds. Uh, for someone who might be an aspiring comedian, any pointers, tips? Stay you out of the business or anything? Or? No. <laughs> if you really want to do it, you just have to do it. And you have to make up your mind to go out there every night and write every day and just figure out what's funny for you. Do you think it's important to do your own material as opposed to have other people write it for you? There's no way to do anything another way. It costs millions of dollars. It costs uh -huh. a lot of money. <laughs> all right. And you don't have a style. There's nothing for anyone to write for. You have that's, to do it all yourself. That's Goodbye. all the time we have tomorrow. Little Richard reminisces. Reminiscences. Reminiscences. Easy for me to say right here on People Are Talking. Take care. Pancake batter, the first frozen pancake batter good enough for Aunt Jemima.